I am so excited to begin this series on rest and play, living a life of rest and play. And so before we dive in, I just want you to take a minute in your own bodies, in your own chairs, wherever you are sitting at home, beloveds, and I want you to relax. You might need to kick off your shoes, put down your notebook if you're trying to take notes, and let's just begin to practice being and letting be. From the book 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, one of the commitments is to live a life of rest and play. The commitment is, I commit to creating a life of play, improvisation, laughter. I commit to seeing all of life unfold easily and effortlessly. I commit to maximizing my energy by honoring rest, renewal, and rhythm. Or, when I am giving my power away to systems and structures that do not acknowledge my divinity, I commit to seeing my life as very serious, that it requires hard work and effort and struggle I see play and rest as distractions from effectiveness and efficiency. And yet, right? And yet, when we are in alignment with the truth of who we are, when we are in alignment that we are here by divine appointment, whatever version of divinity, of the absolute, of the one of Allah, of the goddess, mother, creator, whatever your idea of this greater wisdom and truth and being, we are each here on purpose, not by accident, as a creation of the one itself. Been gifted this aliveness, been gifted this breath in our bodies, and this incredible opportunity to bring our unique selves to life itself. And so when we give our power away, when we succumb to societal norms that are full of shiznit, when we allow structures and systems to tell us who we are, and tell us who we are in a way that is absolutely untrue, we lose contact with our actual true nature. We put ourselves on the shelves, we put our dreams on the shelves, we put our desires on the shelves, we put our visions on the shelf because we just like, need to be a cog on the wheel who's doing the right thing, is being a productive citizen. We judge ourselves. We judge ourselves as wrong and broken if we are not holding ourselves to the societal norms of what it is we're supposed to be doing with this gift of aliveness. We think something's gone wrong when we just want to lay down. We think something is wrong with us if we need eight or nine hours of sleep. I'll tell you a story. I recently went to the doctor and he was, they always ask me, like, how's your sleep? And I'm like, I sleep good. Like, I sleep a lot. <laughs> but I, I went into my doctor's appointment thinking that that was a problem. We should probably fix that, because I sleep like nine hours every day. That's wrong, right? <laughs> he looked at me and he was like, damn, I wish I had your sleep habits. <laughs> But this idea that we are not good human beings if we are not up before the sun and doing all the things and being productive and achieving. Right? It's silly. It's straight up silly. And we dishonor the divine. Which is why Thomas Merton in the reading Clarissa shared said, it is a revolutionary act to rest. It is a revolutionary, radical choice to slow down, to make a getting centered, 
and getting in touch with our true nature. It is straight up anti-white supremacy. It is straight up anti-patriarchy. It is straight up anti all the things. When you choose your true nature as the priority. I'm gonna take questions later. Hang on to that thought, my love. Trisha Hershey, who is famous for creating the nap ministry, and if you don't follow her on Instagram, I highly recommend it. Because you need to see her posts coming across your feed throughout the day, right? One of my favorite that she posts regularly is lay your ass down. And I'm like, yeah, let me lay down for a minute. Let me, let me remember that my doingness is not where my value lives. She says the time to rest is now because it's not a privilege. It is our right. It's a human right. She goes on to say, I want to reimagine rest to be a slowing down, a mindfulness, a paying attention. And I love this concept because I think in our culture, we've begun to associate rest or slowing down with numbing, with shutting the world out, with binging Netflix. And this is not rest. This is numbing. And I know I have to do it sometimes because the world is bananas. But rest is about paying attention to the divine, to bringing our attention back within to connect to our true nature. In our last series, we did a talk and a discussion on what it means to live inside out. I think one of our prayer requests was about connecting to that, that inside so that it could reflect on the outside which I believe in, in most spiritual communities, that's what we're up to. We're trying to live a life that's meaningful, that we feel good about, that we feel on purpose with, right? We want to feel the, the strength and the power and the, the capacity to meet life with our best selves. We also want to feel like we are our best selves. And, and I think sometimes we get lost because of the circumstances of the world, because of the conditions that are more and more chaotic than they've ever been, where we are seeing violence and poverty on a level that I don't know we've seen in our lifetime. And yet there's this greater truth that is more powerful than that. But in order for us to begin to access the thing that we really long for, which is to know ourselves as good, to know our aliveness is purposeful, to be able to reel ourselves back in from everything that is causing so much anxiety and hopelessness. And the way to do that is resting into our truth, resting into the divinity that we have access to at all times and to untangle ourselves from these false ideas of what makes us good. There is nothing out here that makes you valuable. There is nothing out here that is going to give you more value than you inherently have. You were born divine. You were born with an access to wisdom and intelligence and love that is uninterruptible. And the way we begin to find that is by sinking into that inner place that cannot be broken, that cannot be harmed, that cannot be undone, that is never missing living inside out, allowing that impulse, that place in your own being that is peace, that is joy, that is love, and that becomes the leader in your life. 
That becomes the reservoir that is ever full that you drink from and are fed from. Because when we start saying, well, if this thing over here would just get better, then I, then I would be okay. Right? Or as many of us who deeply, deeply want to be good humans, who want to be allies, who want to be of service, right? Anybody suffer from that ill? So we get really caught up in like, if I could just help more people, if I could just hand out more food, if I could just solve the housing crisis, <laughs> then I would be good, then I would find peace, then it would all be okay. And yet, when we approach life from here, those outer circumstances defining how I move in the world, when you approach life getting your identity created by those circumstances, what is it that you can bring to those circumstances other than anxiety and pressure and fear? Which, my beloveds, you then become part of the problem. When you bring your anxious, worried self as a solution, how, how are you helping? How are you helping anybody? You get exhausted, you burn out, and then you show up attempting to be an ally, attempting to be of service. In reality, you are hoping that that very dire circumstance will feed you, will make you feel better. It's not kind. It's actually not love. But when you have laid down, and settled into your amazing, incredible, unique, brilliant self, and fed it all the things that it needs, right nourishment, right rest, right environment, right pace, and you take that self out into the world, Oh, now you're about business. Your very presence becomes a salve for others. The very light radiating from your being becomes an ally to anyone you put yourself around. And that cannot happen if you don't first give yourself permission to prioritize your divine nature. Trisha Hershey went on to say, I believe taking moments of silence is a form of rest. Taking long baths, a longer shower, prayer, meditation, daydreaming, doing a sun salutation in the morning, sitting on your couch for a few minutes before you rush out to do 300 more things, giving yourself 10 minutes of intentional time listening to your body. When is the last time you sat still for 10 minutes just to listen to yourself? Has anybody sat still in the last 10 week for 10 minutes to listen? Yes. What if we did it every day? Just like we must do food and water every day. What if we decided that God put us here on purpose, that Allah put us here on purpose, that Mother Earth birthed us here on purpose, right here and right now. And if that were true, it seems to me 10 minutes a day is almost laughable. 10 minutes a day to honor this incredible gift of our life. It seems to me if we truly made real which is one of our steps of prayer here in this community. We call it realization, making something real. If we made real our divine nature, if we made real that we were uniquely placed here by divine appointment on purpose in this life, if that was real, how might we honor our aliveness? 
in a new way. We would take a nap. That's right. <laughs> right? Like when you really begin to make it real that I am a precious, precious life of the one. And yet I treat myself like I am a slave to society and production and achievement. And yet, the fact that there is breath in my body, my value is already handled. The fact that you are sitting here in a chair with me, with your beloveds, we are already inherently valuable. There's actually nothing to prove, nothing to argue, because here we are. Because here we are. And think about how you handle a baby. And parents, all that you will do to love and protect and guide your child, all that you don't say to them because you honor how precious they are. And yet, I want you to think about, do you bring that same preciousness to how you treat yourself? Are you willing to take yourself into your own arms and cradle your precious being to make sure that the sheets are clean and the bed is just the right softness? That we don't overschedule the day so that enough nap time and rest time and feeding time can happen with ease and grace. <laughs> What if that was actually the way we honor the divine? And what if, by making that choice to truly take your divine nature as the number one priority in your life and honoring that divine nature in whatever ways your wisdom tells you to do so, what do you imagine begins to happen in society? when we know ourselves as precious. And when we know, ooh, I am here by divine appointment with breath in my body on purpose, which must also mean that's true for everybody else. What begins to happen in our relationships? Say it louder. More kindness. More kindness. What else? Harmony. Harmony. What else begins to happen? Grace. Grace. Healing. All of a sudden, we don't need a big old corporate nonprofit structured program to make everybody's lives work. We just start to be good to one another because we honor each other as precious and divinely appointed. We begin to make real the truth that there is inherent interconnected connectedness, there's a tapestry of life that we are each a thread on and are responsible to. And we don't need an outside force, an outside authority to tell us how to be good, to tell us what makes us valuable, because our goodness and our value is already so. It just becomes our honor and privilege to live a life that is an expression of our true nature. Which is why we commit ourselves to living a life of rest and play. That rest and play is a natural way of being. We had an incredible event here on Friday night um, that was this embodied belonging was the basic idea. And we had a little one here, Lakota. Oh, the preciousness. I don't know, she was three or four, and she was not going to be stopped from dancing. Nor was she going to be stopped from being right in the middle of the dance. And anyone who chose to dance with her immediately leapt into their own delight. Immediately found themselves unapologetically living a life of play. 
And so many folks, us grown folks, you know, us grown folks, we take it all very seriously. We're like, I want some of that. And another one of our grown folks who had the, the, the wisdom to dance with that little one said, oh, we all have that. We just forgot. We got serious. We got busy being productive and achieving the things in an attempt to feel valuable. An attempt most times to, to try to prove to the world that our lives are worthy, that our lives matter. Trisha Hershey in one of her uh, blogs or articles, one of the places I've read, she talked about for black and brown bodied folks that rest is reparations. Yeah. That we can actually rest some extra for all those ancestors. Like, I got you. I know you didn't get none of this in your lifetime. I'm going to rest for you. This is not only a spiritual practice to slow down and listen, to be mindful. One of my promises to myself in my life right now is to move at a pace of mindfulness so that I can hear what is the next right step, so that I can begin to dismantle the structures and societal norms that have told me I am not worthy. So that I can begin to pull those weeds from my own consciousness, from my own misbeliefs, and get in touch with what is true. And it's only from there that I want to bring myself to life that I want to bring myself to relationships, that I want to bring myself to community. Because I recognize that my presence can be beneficial or can be hurtful. And I choose to take responsibility for my small piece of this one life that we share together. Which is why justice and spirituality are not two separate things. Showing up as your true nature is justice. And especially for marginalized folks, finding your way to your true nature and committing yourself to living a life that honors the truth of who you are is activism. Our very beings our very loving is justice. Cornel West defined justice as what love looks like in public. Do you see how justice is, is not a political issue? It's a spiritual issue. What love looks like in public. But if you don't know how to be the love that you are, how can you bring it out into the public realm? If you happen to be a policymaker and you're exhausted and burnt out and in fear, what you bring into policy? Fear. fear. Which turns into violence real quick. Our ability to unapologetically own the truth of who we are, our true nature, our God-given gifts, our absolutely God given unique shaped self of which there is no other shape in the world, in the universe. And when you choose to bring your wholeness to life itself, you now are changing the world. You now, you now are doing all that needs to be done in service to humanity in service to climate change, in service to ending poverty. Your wholeness is required for those changes to happen. But you have a right 
an inherent birthright, as Trisha says, to take all the time you need, all the practices you need to find that self, to discover the wonder in amazing, unique ways that you have been divinely appointed in this life. Ernest Holmes, who is the founder of Science of Mind, said, perfect trust in God within is the secret of relaxation, rest, and renewal. Perfect trust that there is a divinity in your being that you have access to. Because the only place that we meet God is in our own bodies. Even if that body is reading sacred text, even if that body is praying, it's still your body that is giving you the opportunity to meet the divine. So if this is the only place that divinity can be accessed, I'm thinking the body is a really important thing to prioritize and care for. Amen? Amen. And that this is the place we access our ability to do rest and renewal and connect to the rhythm of life itself and our place in that rhythm. Which is one of the reasons why I have taken on, and Clarissa mentioned this earlier, the practice of Shabbat or Sabbath, which comes from the Jewish tradition, which is taking one day a week to be an absolute rest. I got, I got nothing on the calendar. I turned off all the screens. So if for those of you who get mad that I don't get back to you on Tuesdays, that's why. I, I go off grid all the way. And I give myself over to whatever, whatever wants to unfold. And sometimes it's a whole lot of napping. Sometimes it's putzing in the garden. But I want to share with you how Shabbat is, pra is practiced and talked about in this modern world, and it comes from this website, Reboot, Reboot, which is a Sabbath manifesto. And they have 10 principles, but they, before they go into those principles, Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg says, Shabbat practice is critical in an exploitative culture a way of learning how to exist as someone whose worth is not based on what one produces or makes or does. It's not based on one who pleases or one who serves. To have a day a week, a regular practice just to be. Can you imagine just having a whole day set aside every week where your, your whole job is just to be? Does it feel like you can give yourself that? I see a lot of heads like, no, I can't do that. A whole day? That's crazy talk. There are seven days in a week, and one of them can't be for your own being. And this is what I'm talking about when we begin to understand how precious we are. And of course we can give ourselves a day a week. I'm thinking maybe we get to, like that's a starting place. Let's, let's make the goal, let's give ourselves all seven days. But I'll let you start with one. Because we must untangle ourselves from who we think we're supposed to be. We must dismantle the inherited misbeliefs of what makes us valuable. So that one day a week is a step in beginning to come back home. So the Sabbath Manifesto from Reboot, here's some recommendations they have. Now these are recommendations. Don't freak out. Avoid tech connect with loved ones, nurture your health, get outside, avoid commerce, 
That's a big one. Don't go shopping for a whole day. Not even online. Light some candles. Drink some wine. Or for those of you who are not drinkers, drink some tea. Eat bread. Eat all the carbs. I don't care if you're on keto. Take a day off. Find silence and give something back. Rev. Angel Kyoto Williams said at the top of the pandemic, one of, one of the skills she believed we would need the most in this time, in this falling apart, in this crumbling, in this chaos, in this insanity that we find in the world, the most important skill we would need was to learn how to vibrationally slow down. To get in a practice of regular stillness so that we could slow our own pace internally in order to meet the world, in order to be in the world. And I don't disagree. So if the one thing you do, if you really can't give yourself a day, and really, like, come talk to me after, because we're going to talk about how you can. If you can give yourself 10, 15 minutes of stillness every day and begin to grow your muscles of being with yourself and your nature, and that's it. No goals, no outcomes, no measures. Just get still, screen-free stillness, which I know is always challenging for some, to spend some time with the precious gift that you are. You can do this. Life is calling each of us, been calling. And this is a simple, simple way to answer the call that life has been given, inviting us to. Rest. And if, if what you got is 10 minutes, then 10 minutes. You're worth it already. Take the invitation to rest.